Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. It is an unusual thing to do, I might note at the very beginning of today's sermon, to preach about the psalm. But the truth of the matter is that while we seldom preach the psalm, the psalm is actually, psalms are actually the largest book in the Bible. They span in writing for over a thousand years. The first psalm, Psalm 90, was written by Moses. And while half of the book is written by David, there are multiple authors. Each of them are writing poetry, if you will, about God's relationship in the world. In fact, psalm means poetry, which is sung to a stringed instrument. There are essentially four things that are major themes in the book of Psalms. And the first is the importance of praise. If we do nothing else in our lives, we are asked by the psalmist to praise God for all that we experience in our lives, for those things that challenge us and for those things which give us pleasure and peace. We are also reminded in the Psalms that prayer is most important. Now, I'm not talking about prayer that is a laundry list of things that we might ask for God. I am talking about prayer as conversation that we, a conversation that we might have with our best friend, with someone that we might open our lives up to and pour out our souls so that we then might listen to God and follow the directions that God gives us through the answering of our prayers, through the conversations that we have with God. Now, where do we find uh, these answers? How is it that we hear God? Well, some might hear that still, small voice inside, which leads us to where it is that God wants us to be. But most often, we hear God in those that we encounter if we train ourselves to listen. It might be some stray thing that someone says to you that is in context to a prayer that you have asked God to solve for you. It, it might be in some piece of music that you hear that brings you to a place that is thin where the veil between this place and the next is thin and God is audible and you see God. It might be in art. God speaks to us in different ways at different times for different reasons. And each time that God speaks to us, we must be able to hear what it is that God says, even if the answer might be no, even if we might not like what it is that God is saying to us because it might challenge us or it might frighten us. But being willing to listen to God is absolutely one of the most important things that we can do as followers of Jesus Christ. There is an important part of the Psalms which talks to us about the responsibility that we have to come together in corporate worship. Corporate worship is important because it is one of the primary ways in our lives in which we come together to give praise and thanksgiving to God for all that God gives to us. It is that time in our lives when we come together as a community of faith and we not only acknowledge what it is that God is doing for us in our lives, but we receive the sacramental life that God calls us to through what we do at this table. Jesus commanded us, Jesus commanded us through his disciples to do this in remembrance of me. It is not merely an act of obligation, it is actually an act of devotion which will feed us and will strengthen us so that we might go into the world and do what it is that God is calling us to do. And the Psalms poetically remind us of the beauty and creativity of God in all that God does, in all that God created. It connects us with the world around us. It reminds us that we are stewards over all that God gives us. 
On the seventh day, God rested, and he gave dominion to humanity, to men and women. Now, dominion, as you've heard me say before, is not about power over creation, to use unrighteously as we see fit and as serves our personal and selfish needs. It is responsibility for all that God has given us. Now, when we talk about that, especially at this time of year, we oftentimes talk about it as if we are talking about just money, just material well-being. But God gave us much more than that. He gave us this good earth and all that it is in it for our nurture and our welfare and our well-being. He does give us our material blessings, but most importantly, he gives us our relationships. Look around you. These are people that you've known for decades, many of them. Some of you still bear unforgiveness for past conflicts. That is not what it is that God calls us to. God calls us to a life of forgiveness, to a life of love, to a life of caring and nurturing of one another. In other words, being a good steward in this world is more than just sharing your material wealth. It is caring for the relationships in your life. It is caring for this good earth. It is caring for your own health and your own well-being. In today's Psalm, Psalm 19, we see just four, uh, excuse me, seven verses. And it starts out with the law of the Lord is perfect. Now, what does that mean? Really and truly, the better translation of that first line would be that the teachings of the Lord are complete. They're whole. If there is anything that you struggle with in your life, if you bring it to God in prayer, then through God's teachings and through the conversation that you have with God, you will learn what it is that you must learn in order to become the person that God created you to be. It is in God's teachings, which are whole or perfect, that our souls are revived. Revived. Are given new energy, new life. Are given the kind of peace and comfort and ability to endure in a world which challenges us and takes from us constantly. We live in a world of exhausted exhausted people. Are you one of them? I remember many, many years ago when I was in a parish and I was responsible while being there for the teenage youth. And one of the 17-year-old high school boys who happened to be quarterback of the football team, who was an honor roll student who belonged to more service organizations than you could shake a stick at, came up to me in the middle of a group of people and looked at me, me for a moment and began to weep. He began to sob. And when I asked him what was wrong, he said, I would just love to have some time to play, to just be a 17-year-old boy who had learned that the only way to get ahead in this world is to overschedule oneself, is to try to be all things to all people and to be perfect at what it is that we do. That is not what God asks of us. In our lives and in our relationships with one another, God is asking us to do small things for the world around us, for each other, even in our own parish community. Small things, but to do them with great love. That is one of the teachings which is whole and perfect that the Lord gives us, which revives our soul. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart, the psalm tells us. Those teachings are just and perfect. We don't get to challenge them the way I often hear people challenge them because they don't fit their narrative or because they don't fit the image of God that they have created. Let me remind you here and in this place and on this Sunday that you and I were created in the likeness and image of God. God is not created in our likeness and image. And if we are to be followers of Jesus Christ, and if we are, to become the people that you and I were created to be, then we must learn to sacrifice our own selfish needs and wants 
to follow where it is that God will lead us. That is what Moses was trying to teach the group of people that he was with as he led them out of Egypt. These are people who prayed for generations to be freed from the bondage of their suffering and slavery. And when they were finally freed and they went into the wilderness, the first thing they began to do was to complain and gripe that things weren't happening the way they wanted them to happen. The fear of the Lord is clean, the psalm tells us. Do we mean afraid? No, we do not mean afraid. You should not fear God as in afraid. The fear that we are talking about in this particular psalm and throughout Holy Scripture is awesome respect for God. That's what it means to fear the Lord, to respect God with all of your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And that leans, leads to clean living that allows us to endure forever. If we are doing the things that God tells us to do, then when it comes time for us to stand before the judgment bar, there is no reason to be afraid. In all of our imperfections, God loves us. And if we understand that God loves us, and if we are repentant from those things which have led us astray, then we have nothing to be afraid of, but we must respect Almighty God with every fiber of our being. That's what it means to offer praise to God. That's what it means to come together in corporate worship. That's what it means to understand that beauty and creativity in the world about us are tantamount to the most important things that we can do. Because it is by these things, the psalmist tells us, that the servant is enlightened. And in keeping them there is great reward. Above all, keep your servants from presumptuous sin. So what is presumptuous sin? It is presumptuous of us to create God in our image and our likeness. It is presumptuous of us to break relationship with Almighty God, especially when God calls us to do things that make us uncomfortable or to go places where we simply don't want to go. It is presumptuous of us to live a life of unforgiveness when someone about us has hurt us and or betrayed us because we don't think that they are worthy of our forgiveness. Those things break relationship with God. And God says that we should not allow those things to have dominion over our lives, to have power over us. That we should strive to be whole and sound and innocent of great offense. And the last thing that the psalmist tells us is something that is part of a beautiful prayer that we often say as Episcopalians, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. In other words, let us live out in our lives those things that we profess with our mouths, those things that we say we believe. And if we don't believe them, or if we are not believing them seriously enough, then we need to take a look at ourselves and our lives and in our relationship with Almighty God. Because trust me when I tell you, you do not want to stand before the judgment bar having been unfaithful and untrue to those things that we say we profess with our lips but do not live out with our lives. That is why oftentimes when someone like me stands up here what we are saying when we say that prayer is please, Lord, please, please, please let the words of my mouth be acceptable to you in your sight. Let them be in accordance with your will, not mine. Let me speak truth to people even when they don't want to hear the truth that you have given me to speak and most of all, open their hearts 
as hard as they may be or may have become, let their hearts be open so that they might hear and that they might be transformed, that they might inwardly digest, that they might let those words, those words that have come to us down through the millennial, through the Psalms, through the Old Testament stories and through the teachings of Jesus Christ. Let those words transform us, Lord, so that we might go forth into the world and change what it is that needs to be changed. Let the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our Redeemer.